Um, our text this morning is Matthew 21 to 16. And the story we're about to read is commonly known as the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Um, many scholars consider the parable to be one of the most difficult parables to interpret, to make sense of. Uh, because like any parables, uh, it's hard to know what's supposed to be symbolic and what the symbols mean. Uh, in his parables, Jesus loved to use everyday life as the basis of his stories. But here are a few things that I want you to be informed of before we read the story, so that the story will come out so much more alive for all of us. There are several things in this parable that, that just don't add up. And biblical scholars have been arguing over these details since at least the third century. Uh, for example, it doesn't add up that the owner of the vineyard would be hiring his own workers. Why? Because as you'll see, he has a manager. Right? And that's supposed to be the manager's job. That's something that the manager would do. But instead, he does it himself. And then it doesn't add up that the owner keeps coming back to the marketplace to hire more workers throughout the day because any self-respecting vineyard owner, winemaker, would know how many workers he needed. And then he would just hire them all at once, first thing in the morning. And then the most obvious thing that doesn't add up is the way the workers get paid at the end of the day. But Jesus is a master storyteller. He knows the way to set up the scene to grab his disciples' attention. He knows how to build the suspense and introduce the conflict that creates a good story to pull us in to the narrative. And he knows how to resolve that conflict so that his listeners never forget the moral of the story. And with Jesus, that moral of the story is not what anyone expects it to be. And so that's the background information before we read the text, Matthew 21 to 16. It is a long text. It's mouthful, and after I read it, I will say, this is the word of the Lord. Please receive it as so by responding, saying, thanks be to God. Okay? Matthew 21 to 16. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he, went about, when he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last work only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us to enter into the reality of these words that you have spoken. And by your power, the power of your Holy Spirit, allow us to understand, not so much with our mind, but mostly with our heart, 
and we will understand more about this upside-down kingdom that you're bringing into the world. And we will gladly follow this kingdom. And this kingdom will go even further to live and become our reality every day. And the world become blessed through it and what we are doing as we also usher your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, for this lesson to make sense, we need to know a little background. Uh, in last week's story of the unforgiving servant, you remember, we learned that a denarius was a usual day's wage in the first century. But this wage wasn't a huge sum. It wasn't enough to get by. It was barely enough to get by, actually. And that's why the Torah insisted the laborers be paid at the end of each day they work, because they needed the money, the family needed the money, for the next day. Because those who lived on a denarius a day struggled just above the poverty line. And just like today, some employers then took advantage of day laborers. Surprise, surprise. Right? Paying them as little as possible for extremely difficult and dangerous work. But this was not always the case. Uh, the first century historian Josephus tells us that following the completion of the second temple, there were 18,000 workers unemployed. And so to meet their needs and to make sure that the temple treasury was never so full of money that it would draw the attention of the Romans, it actually became customary for the temple to hire workers and to hire workers to do minimal labor while receiving a full day's pay. And so when Jesus sets up the story, the number of laborers and even the flat rate that was paid to all of them, they were all within the realms of possibility. It would make sense to them. This is not something that is totally off. Right? We have a gracious landowner who reminds us of a gracious God. Then we get to the conflict of the parable. It just doesn't make sense that the landowner who hired the workers would tell his manager to pay them in reverse order. There would have been no complaints from the first workers hired if they just taken their money and left, right, before the later workers received their pay, because they would never have known how much the other workers got paid. And they wouldn't have cared. They got what was promised to them, and that would have been good enough. And so imagine their pleasant surprise when they see workers who had barely in the vineyard long enough to break a sweat getting a full day's pay. Imagine their delight as they realize this landowner has a generous spirit. They feel good about the work they've done. And they've just trust the landowner to be as generous with them as he had been with the latecomers to the vineyard. And so as they step up to the pay table, a smiling, big grin in their face, and expectant, ready to say thanks to the for the landowner's generosity. <laughs> and they're certainly ready to come back tomorrow for another day of hard labor. As they reach out to take what's rightfully theirs, they are already thinking of the food they will buy for their children, of the debts they can begin to pay off with what is left over. Okay? And then the manager drops into their waiting hand one denarius, a usual day's pay. The same pay those lazy bums who only work one hour got. It's not fair, he said. It's not fair. But they know that the manager isn't to blame. He's just doing his job, right? And so they turn immediately to the landowner and demand to know what's going on here. The landowner's reply is something like, well, it's my money. <laughs> it's my money. I'll do whatever I want with it. Definitely not a satisfying response to them, we've been working all day. They were hoping for, oh, my mistake, of course you should be paid more. And then, not only that, there's a real stinger. He said, are you jealous? Are you envious? Because I was generous with others. Now, you've probably heard about this text. Some scholars think this parable is about salvation, about salvation history and the tension that exists between Jews and Gentile Christians in the early church. The Jew, Jewish Christian would be asking, shouldn't the Gentiles have to follow the law just as we have 
all in order to be counted as children of God, we have been following the law for centuries. Why should they get the same reward as those of us who've lived under the law since birth? Other scholars think it's about salvation, meaning teaching us that there is no difference in the eyes of God between faithful Christians who have lived a holy life since childhood and those who make a deathbed confession of faith. And that scholars have assigned different meanings, different meanings to different elements of the story. And some arguments are plausible, they are some convincing, while others aren't so convincing. But what if this story is actually trying to tell us that the kingdom of God operates not in the way we expect it to be? At least not in the way we expect it to be in our wage-based society. We live in a wage-based society. And what if the story is about how God takes our human understanding of the way things work and actually stands it on its head? What if the point is that God uses a different pay scale than the one that we use in our wage-based society? God's pay scale isn't based on our merit, but God's pay scale is based on God's great love for us. It is based on grace. God's pay scale gives us our daily bread so that we will depend on God completely. You see, we could all tell our own version and our experience of this parable. We know people who, in our not-so-humble opinion, neither deserve nor earn what they got, either a job, a promotion, a recognition, a raise, happiness, success, and we think they don't deserve it, right? We think we worked longer, we tried harder, and it seemed to make no difference. More often than not, we view the world and ourselves and others through this lens of fairness rather than grace, which is the exact opposite of how God views the world and how God views our lives. We've been taught from an early age that fairness matters. When a bunch of children play, it won't be long before you hear someone say, that's not fair, right? I mean, if you capo capo to the kids' church, one of them will say that, that's not fair, right? And we take that to adulthood. We adults want fairness. We read that in the Old Testament text. Jonah's crying to God, it's not fair. But too often fairness, rather than love, rather than acceptance, rather than mercy or forgiveness, or generosity is the measure by which we act and judge another person or life circumstances. We like fairness. We like fairness because it gives us some assurance of order. It gives us some assurance of predictability, of control and hierarchy, even if it's a false assurance. Fairness is based on what we deserve how hard we work, what we achieve, the way in which we behave. That's fairness. And sometimes it is fair to give a reward, other times a punishment. We live in a, and we live and we promote a wage-based society in which we earn what we get, right? We deserve the consequences, good or bad, of our actions. That's what we believe. But then God came to the picture. And what happens when divine goodness trumps human fairness? That is precisely what we get in today's parable. Today's parable shows that wages and grace actually stand in opposition to each other. They are two opposing world views. And to the degree to which this parable strikes us as unfair, it is the degree to which our life and worldview is wage-based. A wage-based worldview allows little room for grace in our own life or the lives of others. No room, right? Because grace is dangerous. Really? Yes. Grace is really dangerous. Why? Because it reverses business as usual, 
So the last will be first, and the first will be last. That's not how a wage-based society works. The world says the last are the last, and the first are the first because they deserve it. (laughs) It's what we believe to be fair. Our understanding of fairness, however, does not seem to have priority in the kingdom of heaven. Does not have priority at all where grace is the rule, not exception. Grace looks beyond our productivity, our appearance. Grace looks beyond our dress, our race, our ethnicity, our accomplishments, even our failures. Grace recognizes that there's more to you and who you are than what you have done or left undone, just like what we confessed earlier in our confession prayer. Grace reveals the goodness of God. Wages, on the other hand, reveal human effort. Grace seeks unity. Grace seeks inclusion. Wages makes distinction. Wages separate. Grace just happens. Wages are based on merit. The only precondition of grace is that we show up and we open ourselves to receive what God is giving to us. And when we do, we begin to see our lives, we begin to see the world, we begin to see our neighbor in a different way. That's grace. Uh, Many of you know that before going to seminary, I work in different areas for a number of years, uh, from crazy work to more serious work. (laughs) Uh, My last job was actually in this holding company of a television network, and the last position before leaving to go to seminary was actually looking at how our sales are doing in terms of advertisement sales uh, in light of our programming, in light of our TV programming. And in the sales department every month, there's a score sheet. There's a score sheet that would be distributed to all the sales folks in the company. It listed the name, the sales team, the salespeople, and the number of hours they work and the number of sales monies that are collected by them or by their team. And that number was the basis for their incentive, their bonus, and then, of course, for comparison of performances. And among themselves, that is also the basis for competition, for expectation and judgments among the different sales team. We knew who had begun work early, and we know who go home early as well. That whole system is what a wage-based society is. It is a system that is built around the idea that we are self-sufficient, we are deserving, and we are independent. But grace reminds us that we are neither. We are not nearly as self-sufficient, deserving, or independent as a wage-based society would lead us to believe. And neither is our own worth determined by our productivity. Neither our worth is determined by our usefulness to another. Our worth is determined by our identity that we are children of God. And grace does not justify or excuse discrimination. Grace does not justify unfairness. Grace certainly does not justify oppression. To the contrary, grace holds before us the truth that each person is more than their behavior, their looks, their accomplishments, or even their failures. The tragedy of a wage-based life, I almost say waste, (laughs) wage-based life, because wage-based life can actually be wasteful, the tragedy of a wage-based life is that it blinds us to the presence of God. It blinds us to the life of God in our own life, in the life of others. And it can make us resentful of grace. It can make us resentful of goodness and beauty in the life of of ourselves and another. And then it separates us and isolates us from one another. Eventually, we set up standards. We set up standards and expectations not only for ourselves, but others as well. And we set expectations for God. That's what happened to the first hire in today's parable. 
They saw themselves as different. They saw themselves as more deserving than the later hired. And so they grumbled, just like Jonah grumbled. They grumbled against the landowner saying, these last work only one hour and you made them equal to us. The truth is they are not that different from each other, really. Because neither group owned the vineyard, right? Both groups needed a job, and both groups were chosen. Both groups were invited in by no effort of their own doing. There is, however, something that, it, that distinguishes the first hired and the later hired. And the distinction is not what time they showed up to work. The real distinction between the first hire and all the later hire is the terms under which they entered the vineyard. The first hire entered the vineyard only after agreeing to the usual daily wage, which to me, actually, they settle for too little, right? They shortchange themselves. And that's often what happens in a wage-based society. We shortchange ourselves. Apparently, the landowner is willing to pay more than the usual daily wage, a full day's wage for less than a full day's work. That's not fair, we say. Right? No, it's not. It's grace. That's grace. The first hire got what they bargained for. The later hire, those who come at 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., even 5 p.m., did not, however, negotiate for the usual daily wage. If you pay attention, they entered the vineyard trusting that they would be paid whatever is right. Whatever is right. And whatever is right is not determined by the first hired or by a wage-based society, but by the goodness of the land owner, by the goodness of God. These later hired workers receive more than they earn, more than they deserve, more than they had right to ask or hope for, because that's just how God works. That's just what God does. Whatever is right is not about fairness, but about grace. And so why settle for the usual daily wage when God wants to give us whatever is right for our life, for our needs, for our salvation? Whatever is right will always be more than fair, more than what we could ask or imagine. Yet sometimes we trust a wage-based society more than we trace grace. We trust grace, right? And in so doing, we deny ourselves and we deny others of the life that God wants to give us. And so how might we begin to move from a wage-based life to a vineyard of grace? How do we do that? Well, first, we have to stop comparing ourselves and our lives to others. And by doing that, we will create room for grace to emerge. We refuse to compete in such a way that someone must lose in order for us to win. And we trust that in God's world, there is enough for everyone. And then we let go of expectation based on what we think we or others deserve. Give God the freedom to pay whatever is right, knowing that God's ways are not our ways. Make no judgments of ourselves or others. That is the way of grace. That is the way of God. Imagine if we all let go of those four things I mentioned earlier. Comparison, competition, expectation, and judgment. And instead of doing all that, we heed the call of God. God calls us to put down the measuring stick altogether. And God is calling us to do what we are gifted and called to do as workers in God's kingdom. And so let's roll up our sleeves and head into the vineyard, the vineyard of grace. Because we have been called to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Let's get to work and watch that your life would be God-filled. Watch that your life would make space for a life of another to also be God-filled. And watch the world 
also be God-filled. And as the parable tells us, would look a lot more like the kingdom of heaven. That is our hope. And we are also invited to participate in making that hope real, beginning today. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, today we want to make a commitment that we don't want to compare ourselves with each other because it is pointless and because grace abounds and it is enough for everybody. It is enough to go around and around and around. And so help us as recipients of your grace to be willing to open ourselves up to see how grace is to be poured out to others as well, instead of grumbling, thinking that we don't get what is fair. We don't get what we deserve. Help us to release the way we work in a wage-based society and help us, Lord, to live in the vineyard grace of life that you are asking us to participate in for the glory of your son's name. And in his name we pray and ask. Amen.